I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with Harry Gregson Williams, the composer for The Last Duel. And I wanted to start with just the big picture, which is what it was about this story that excited you creatively in the beginning. Well, I think it's quite a provocative story. Um, and I mean, I guess the, the thing that excited me was that Ridley would call me at all. You know, there's a lot of choice for him out there. Um, and I was really hoping he would, you know, I saw that he was shooting this thing. Um, uh, and then I saw that he, he'd been disbanded and they all had to go home to, to lock down like the rest of us. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the drama was killing me, really. The tension was killing me, but he, he did, he did call me and, and, uh, when he sent me the script, I was, I was surprised. I, I had read that it was, um, you know, a story set in, in, in medieval times. Um, but uh, I had no idea he, he had chosen to tell the story like like he had. Uh, but from reading the script, I did get really excited about it. I, I couldn't wait to get stuck in. And, and that was a perfect opportunity. The lockdown, I'm fortunate to have a home studio. I haven't always had a home studio, but um, I guess I graduated to that um, probably five or six years ago. And uh, so, yeah, I was able to able to continue working, fortunately. Um, but yeah, I t when Red Rick called me, he said, look, read the script, get back to me. Um, and in particular, take note of something on the last page of the script. So I said, oh, this is a surprise ending. Uh, well, I read through and, and, and there we were in the meadow with, uh, with, with um, Marguerite uh, and her son. We don't really know whose son Who's, who fathered that son? And that's not that's that's a moot point, but it's not something that Ridley was ever going to go into. He's going to let the viewer. Uh, he, he did say Ridley did say he's got a kind of sense of humor. That chap. He's like, well, Harry, look at look at the color of his hair. <laughs> you know, Adam Driver's school is black. Maybe and this little kid's got rather light hair. So um, on the final page of the script, it did it said that maybe uh, um, I think that Marguerite maybe whispered a. Uh, or hummed a lullaby to her, to her child. Um, um, she, Ridley said, look, I'm not sure whether I want to do it like this. I'm going to shoot her in a meadow. It's going to be beautiful with wildflowers. It's going to be a lot of color. Um, uh, and she's going to be, she's clearly going to be happy. Let me turn that damn thing off if that's me. I don't know whether it is. Um, oh, God. I lost you. Uh, oh, you're good. No, right here. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'll get so, so um, I said to Rid, well, well uh, that's interesting. What, what, uh, have you got anything in mind? He said, no, well, that's, that's where I'd like you to start. I'm going to go back and, you know, when COVID's, uh, you know, we're allowed to, to go and shoot the rest of this movie. Uh, that's one of the scenes I, I haven't shot yet. I need to shoot. So, so please start by finding something that she might sing. You know, she might, I might choose not to use that in the movie. Uh, in which case we could probably use whatever you create for that moment. You know, we, we maybe don't have the actress sing it, but uh, it can be a vocal. Uh, so that's where I started on the project. And uh, I scratched around in the 1380s for some public domain. I mean, it turned out there was this chap called um, Thibaut de Champagne. Uh, I don't know if I've said that right. Um, a chap who was, you know, knocking out chansons d'amour, uh, a plenty. I mean, like a lot of them. Uh, and that, you know, harmonically and musically, they're kind of quite limited to what the harmonic uh, uh, sort of structure of the day was, which was fairly limiting. Um, uh, but I found something, I wasn't going to take anything from, from him musically, but um, some of his lyrics were quite good and, the, uh, and, and, and um, worked quite well with what we were going to do. It was just a love song to a, to a child. Um, so yes, having found a very simple melody that, that could really be uh, mistaken for a, an authentic uh, 1380s kind of tune. Um, you know, I give it a little twist and a twirl here and there, as is my thing. Um, you know, I played it for Red, he liked it. He went off and <clears throat> shot the end of the movie, came back and, and lo and behold, I, I scrolled to the end of the movie and indeed he'd chosen not to shoot um, Jody's singing. Uh, but, you know, he called me, he said, look, why, why, I, there's a great start and I love the vibe of this. If you can develop it for Marguerite's theme, boom, we have one of the thematic uh, elements that we're going to need. So, so that's where I, that's where I, I set sail. Um, 
The other things I really wanted to explore were a vocal element, and it seemed very apt for this, and it seemed like um, something I'd explored a little bit on Kingdom of Heaven with him some years earlier. Um, and quite often in my scores, whether it be a Narnia or a Shrek or a, even a Tony Scott film, um, you know, I like I love to use vocals. I, I trained as a as a vocalist myself at many moons ago. Um, so this was exciting for me, and I wanted to find uh, a solo female vocalist um, that was quite precise and pure, not not operatic and full of vibrato. Uh, uh, and um, actually, the film editor Claire Simpson pointed me in the direction of a. Um, a record to listen to by an English soprano, um, really uh, a fabulous girl, um, and wondered if if she might be available. Now this was this was <laughs> this was lockdown time, so uh, no one was really being able to record. Uh, anyhow, I traced her. her name's Grace Davidson. Um, so she's a top soprano in England, uh, um, and she had exactly the quality I was looking for. Uh, so she was she was very resourceful uh, and once I'd given her some the music uh, she went off and gave me various versions of this theme humming whispering singing and then with the lyric that I'd found um, uh, I got all those materials back into my studio now the other vocalist I I wanted to experiment with was this chap called Yestin Davis who I'd come across on Kingdom of Heaven actually I hadn't really deployed him very much or very well on Kingdom of Heaven, but I was interested in the, the tonal quality of his voice because he's a countertenor. And if you're not familiar with what that is, it's a, it's a countertenor will always be a man. Uh, but if you hear what he's singing, he's singing maybe an octave, an octave and a half higher than you or I would sing. So you, it could be mistaken for a soprano. However, there's a certain quality there that's that's, I won't say unnerving, but can be quite haunting and strange. Uh, and so, you know, I played, I play, I wrote some stuff and had uh, Yestin record it, uh, played it for Rin. He really liked uh, the way uh, um, I had arranged some, some music where, whereby I had Yestin very simply gave him two notes, a little, maybe a perfect fourth or a perfect fifth apart, just uh, um, half an octave apart and asked him to swoop gradually from one note to the next, no lyrics. Uh, and I gave him various pitches, various dynamics. Uh, so I got all this material and brought it back into my, you know, sort of mad professor element into my, my composing studio. Uh, and that's where I created his thematic material, uh, which you will often hear under some of his speeches. Uh, and it's quite unsettling, I think. I used it on the, the uh, uh, yeah, over Jacques Le Gris quite a bit. Now, um, our other protagonist, uh, that being three main protagonists, um, uh, Cruz. His, his, his. I wanted his uh, thematic material to be to start out quite, quite stout and heroic, and maybe warlike drums, and uh, 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 quite expected. Uh, and then throughout the course of the movie, because I think when we first meet him, we think, well, he's okay, kind of a solid chap. Nothing wrong with him. He's a bit, he's a bit dull, isn't he? He's a bit self-important, uh, but these aren't particularly bad qualities. Uh, so, you know, a, a heroic rising theme, which kind of suited the soldier that he was, but I wanted to be able to use that through the three chapters and start to really develop that and have that start to turn corners that you weren't expecting, uh, which, which I think we, as the film evolves, we see, his, he, we see more fully his character. And that he's more than he's more than uh, just a soldier. He's a really self-important bigot. Uh, but he's kind of stuck in the time that he lives in. You know, he probably didn't stick out too too much to the people around him for the person that he was. You know, he's really concerned with uh, uh, his status with his god and his king uh, and his wife. Uh, and uh, you know, he he. he even Legree says that he sincerely loves uh, uh, Marguerite uh, and that they couldn't help themselves, you know, after assaulting her. Uh, it's shocking, really. So uh, having these three elements, I, I didn't deploy them uh, solely in each of the three chapters that Ridley tells, but I was able to focus more on one 
for instance, in the third chapter, where we really, really, really see what, what, what Marguerite's been through, you hear much more of her theme than the others. However, there's, there's this haunting Legree thing uh, creeping up on her the whole time. Uh, so it was a fascinating score to be able to write. And, you know, Ridley's, he's really, uh, he's, he's re it's really rewarding to work with him because, you know, he's such an artist first and foremost. Uh, he's a perfectionist, which makes him tricky to work for. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, but you know, all the things that you'd expect. But um, he's he's uh, you know he's so passionate about film, and he's you know he's I won't say he's in a hurry, but he's you know he's no slouch. He's 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 always looking forward and moving forward, uh, and it's it's uh, it's a challenge to keep up with him, which I I really enjoy. Yeah, you covered a lot of great ground there that I was really curious about. Oh, so thank you for that. No, that was great. That was, that was all good. But I was also interested in this, which is that sometimes when you're watching a film, you really notice the score in a way that can almost be distracting. Whereas yeah. I think I just saw a couple. Of, I saw a couple of things up on the Academy website that I okay. Well, there you go. That that I felt very much like that. I felt yeah, my, yeah. This score is so ostentatious. It's so. Mm -hmm heard that it spoiled the film for me in a couple of instances right right whereas i think this kind of does blend in nicely with the sound and the other craft elements i don't know how intentional that yeah. was but oh, yeah. what kind of discussions did you have about the sort of prominence of the score for the film well you, you know interestingly you should say that because you know having done a few ridley films and many tony scott films this is the first scott brenner film that i i've ever done where it was a conscious decision for me not to underscore the action. Mm. I mean, the Tony Scott films that I've done, Pelham or Deja Vu, or Man on Fire, Spy Game, these films, you know, the, the score's very concerned with the, the action happening uh, and, and underscoring those moments as well as others. Uh, same in Kingdom of Heaven, there's a, you know, uh, the siege of Jerusalem uh, is, is, is a monumental uh, uh, job for the music there. Uh, so, uh, it was decided early on by Ridley and in discussion with me, what would happen if we use music to bring us to the moment that the knights come together, to bring us to the moment that uh, uh, these brutal battles we see Karush uh, uh, doing uh, happen. Uh, not underscore them. Let the, for instance, when in, in Real 7, right at the end of the movie, when, when we actually do see the duel, there's a, a long lead up to it. Well, there's a two hour lead up to it. I mean, the whole film's coming towards that. But, the, uh, you know, there's probably a five or six minute cue that brings us to the moment that the horses and the, the knights come together. And then to leave the horses panting and grunting and the swords strutting and really, really wanted to go for the realism there. Uh, and it was a, quite a relief because, you know, often as a composer, one finds one's kind of at loggerheads with the sound, you know, I mean, Especially, you know, the temptation might be to use percussion underneath what I've just described, the, this, these snorting of the horse and the clashing of the armor. And, you know, in many ways, the, in uh, the way that we did it in last year, that is the percussion. That is, that's all you need. You don't need another element for that. Um, so to bring us to that, those moments, and then very importantly, to bring us out of those moments into the aftermath of what that means emotionally. And so that was interesting for me. Uh, and not not something not not a, not a way that I've scored a film before, uh, which it didn't mean that there was any less music or any any less of a challenge here. It just meant that the, the the focus would be on either side of these big sort of ac action moments. Uh, hmm. And so, having made that decision, I could really really focus on on book ending these these moments. Like for instance, in the in the uh, in the movie leading up to the duel, as I say, the dressing. Uh, actually, uh, as you recall, really split that off. And we see that at the very beginning of the film, yep. but it's still, it's still one, one, one thing. It's one build. Uh, uh, so this, this was, this was uh, new for me. And uh, it was, I, I really, really enjoyed how the sound people, uh, you know, came, came to the table with what they had and knowing that I was going to bring them to a certain place and then back off. Uh, it was quite refreshing. You know, I've been involved in quite a score, few scores where it's like, okay, we're all heading for this moment. <laughs> I'm going to be a bit louder than you. Uh, that's when you're sitting in a, in a theatre and you, you can hear the film next door. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You can hear a sub coming through. Think, oh my God, okay. Uh -huh. uh, so yeah, I imagine not, that is refreshing. 
for it's you. actually good, great. And uh, uh, I think, you know, some, sometimes these choices are made uh, after, after a composer such as myself actually has scored the action moments, delivered the music, and then it's all being brought together at the dub stage. Uh, the poor old dubbing mix has got the sound effects flying at him, the music flying at him, and still there's some dialogue that you've got to be able to hear. So a potential train wreck. Uh, but in this occasion, we, we uh, you know, Rid set the path out right at the beginning, and that's, that's, that's where we went. I, I, I think it, the film looks beautiful, and hopefully it sounds beautiful as well, but the sound uh, that was created, you know, whether it's a crackling file or, or, or you know, in a very quiet scene, uh, and I, you know, you, you can freeze frame any of any moment of this film, and it's it's probably a beautiful picture to look at. Absolutely, That's, I agree. Uh, yeah, Darius Volsky is it's, 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 it's yeah. almost peerless, I'd say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sort of along the lines of what you were saying there, just looking overall at your career, having been in the game as long as you have um, since the 90s, right? Uh, yes. What are the kinds of projects that do excite you, that inspire you to want to be part of them? Well, I think anything led by a Scott brother, you know, I mean, goodness, oh, anything, go. any, any film that a director who's who's clearly at the top of his game, uh, you know, wants me to score, then I, I won't think twice about it. Uh, but, you know, putting that aside, uh, you know, it's any anything with a, a little variation or or, or difference in, in within the challenge is 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 always going to be exciting uh, and pretty nerve wracking. You know, it'd be easy. It probably would have been easy to say, "Well, look, I did the Shreks for God's sake. I'm just going to do kids animation." And by the way, I've got five kids. I I don't think they'd have minded if I if I'd have kept on doing animation. But you know, I, I have been lucky enough to have sort of these two paths going, which was really created by DreamWorks, who let me in the door somehow with Ants and Chicken Run and Shrek and, and everything that followed. And, and, and the Scott brothers with Tony Scott, the enemy of the state, and then Spy Game, Man of Fire, Domino and so forth. And so there were these two sort of avenues that I was able to, to go down and explore. Um, and, and I've tried, tried to maintain that rather than fall back on uh, it's quite a while since I've done an animation. Now. I'm trying to remember how I did them, or whether I'd be any good if I was asked to do another one. <laughs> it's only what you you do get into a bit of a rhythm, and uh, I think I think that's probably it's safe to say that I, I uh, um, it's been beneficial to me creatively to be able to to dance around a little bit. Uh, but then sometimes one's taking on a, a, a new challenge, but with the same director. For instance, Andrew Adamson, uh, who I've done three or four films, five, four or five films with now, um, you know, the Shrek movies. And, uh, and he took me on to do Narnia, two Narnias, which was amazing experience. And then we did a, a peculiar little film called Mr. Pitt with Hugh Laurie in it, uh, which is something I, a drama that I would never have done otherwise if I hadn't met, met uh, Andrew. So, you know, these, these things are, um, are really what, what creative challenges we're really looking for. Yes, well, I think we're all looking for the next animated score that you can uh, <laughs> score. <laughs> Make that your next challenge. See if okay. you can do it again. <laughs> we're already out of time, if you can believe it. But <laughs> for those of you watching, like and subscribe for more interviews and go to goldderby.com to make your Oscar predictions. Harry, thanks so much for talking with me today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.